Hi, my name is Rob Phillips, and I'm from Caltech, and I'm here at the Marine Biological Laboratory in Woods Hole, and um, was here to record another iBio event in a certain sense, and we thought it would be a great opportunity to take advantage of the fact that I'm here with my mom on her 80th birthday, and so what we're going to do is talk about uh, our joint family adventure as I worked my way through science, and I think it'll probably be interesting to people since, as you're going to find out, it was a bit of a, a wild adventure and it required a huge amount of parental support. So, um, so I thought I would just start out with a, an easy question that I think oh, probably good. all the <laughs> listeners are really dying to know, oh, which yeah. is, uh, what, what was your best birthday present ever? You! <laughs> of course. How's that work? That works just fine. Okay. Perfect. So, um, all kidding aside, so, um, so what we're going to do is maybe just take a little bit of a, a travel through the years, say, between ninth grade, I guess, which is when I got a D in algebra, to maybe when I got my job at Brown University, which was the end of our financial dependence on you guys, which is when I was 33 years old. So, you know, that's, that's hard. We grew up in a house full of books. And uh, I've always been a great reader. I'm kind of curious what you think the role of books was in, in our upbringing and, and also in all three of us. There's three, three kids, and all of us are big readers. Well, I think it started when you were all young, mm -hmm. and I read to you, each of you, every single night. Mm -hmm. Even sometimes when we went out before the sitters or so forth came. So I was always a reader. My parents were always readers. And obviously books were hugely important to me personally. And I could tell from reading to you that you really enjoyed it and you took up books in a big way. Yeah. And it was something that we shared. Yeah. And, and I want to just inject something. It, what a thrill it was for me to see when you had your two children, yeah. how you would read to them every night. And sometimes when I would be visiting you, even when Casey was old enough certainly to read, I mean, he was probably 13 or something, yeah. you two were reading... Um, the um, trilogy. Yeah, Tolkien. Tolkien trilogy. Yeah. We also read Haroon and the Sea of Stories from... Right, uh, right. So, I mean, I thought, well, yeah. this is something that just went on. Yeah. So, obviously, we were big into books. I also remember going to lots of used bookstores with you. Right, I was going to come to that. So, um, on April 30th, 1977, that's a day, it's a Saturday, which uh, is the day that I discovered that I was going to do science, when I was given a lecture about how Eratosthenes figured out the radius of the Earth. And in a nutshell, you know, I could, somebody could tell me the radius of the Earth, but in a nutshell, what I learned is that this clever guy measured the radius of the Earth by looking at the shadow of the noonday sun in two different places on the Earth and knowing the distance between the two places. And that endows this question with a realism because it shows you how trigonometry, geometry, clever thinking, optics, you know, all these things get merged. And above all, what it shows is that science is a relationship between one person and nature. There's no authorities. I don't like authorities. There's no books. That. There's no rules. There's no regulations. It's just you and your question. That's what Eratosthenes was. That's what blew my mind. Before that, I thought science was kind of stupid because I thought it was a bunch of memorization of facts. Like mm -hmm. French kings, you know, I thought science was like that. Um, the next morning, I told you and dad that I was going to do science and also told you I wasn't going to go to go to college and that I was going to leave high school after 11th grade. On books, do you remember right after that, you and I went up to L.A. and we went used book shopping yes, and we, we came did. back with like 200 books. I was just curious if you have anything to say. Why did you do that and what was your take on that? Because it was fun. That? Because uh -huh. we were together and we were doing our book thing. Yeah. And, and I was always amazed because you were after books I knew nothing about. Yeah. All these theoretical physics titles I were just totally out of my range. And I could go and look at the things I liked, which was, you know, fiction, nonfiction, whatever. Yeah. But wander around with you. It was just great fun to do that. I mean, what yeah. a kick. Yeah. So in, April, in that April, I was 16 years old. And three months later, I basically left high school after 11th grade with my degree. And shortly thereafter, one of my good friends, as I'm sure you remember very well, was killed in an accident. And uh, that really established that I was no way I was going to go to college. How does that relate? I mean, why does the death, of, I know it's a sorrowful, sorrowful time, yeah. but why that? Why not go to college? Yeah, I don't know if you remember, but I had a, I had a poster in my room of Jack London. 
And yes, I do. It's, uh, it was a picture of him on his boat, and it said, I would rather be ashes than dust. And then it talks about being a fiery meteor rather than a sleepy planet or something like that. And, um, and I just read Irving Stone's book, Jack London, Sailor on Horseback. And so it was the juxtaposition of that book which showed me the life of Jack London, which was really so amazing. Definitely. And then seeing the death of Lance at age 17, you know, it was just, he was snuffed out. And it made me realize, you know, today is a kind of good day to think about it. It's a birthday. At this point, I've reached an age where birthdays I find kind of sad rather than happy days, just in a certain sense. And it's because you realize, you know, life is short and it just flies by. And then it, if you're unlucky, like Lance was, you can just have your life snubbed out. And what I felt is that, you know, going to college was just what you were supposed to do. And I guess I just felt that life is short. I better not do what I'm supposed to do. And I should do what I should do. I just felt I did not want to cave and just go off to UCSB for no reason. I would have just lived in Isla Vista and just right, gone to some stupid classes. All right, but then why did you even get to the point where we, we went up there, you decided because to go you, there, you got an apartment. That Was that because you and dad, pleasing us? Because you and dad insisted that you would let me do my deal if I got into a UC school. So I got into a UC school. Are you satisfied? <laughs> so Did I got in and then, uh, you know, that was good enough. I, then I had satisfied the parental requirement, but I had no interest in going to UCSB or anywhere else. So I didn't. Well, I left home at 17. I moved up to LA shortly. But the real thing that happened is I went off on a boat and I sa sailed 3,000 miles. And what I wanted to ask you about um, has in a certain sense to do with the way I feel about my kids and the adventures they have. I was 17 when I left the, the port at Harbor yeah, Island on, on that boat. And I'm kind of curious, uh, you know, we set off, there was no cell phones, there was, I didn't talk to you for three months, I sent home stupid letters that, you know, came by snail mail. Uh, I'm curious about parental fear in the, in the face of adventure, because there was lots of it that we might touch on, but, you know, what did you and dad have to say about, you know, these things that were Well, it was scary, scary. I mean, when, I, and I remember when you were standing there watching you literally sail away. Yeah. And of course, I was all teary, and I thought, I think maybe I was just stupid and didn't realize how much could happen. Yeah. I was also amazed at the letters that you wrote home, mm. because you were reading all of Shakespeare, as I recall, yeah. trying to go through it one yeah. at a time, and commenting on that, commenting on what you were seeing and feeling. Yeah, although and they I, were, inc we have to be honest, they were incredibly embarrassingly pre pretentious. I mean, I was trying out my Shakespearean vocabulary and looked like a moron. I know, but as a mom, it's okay, <laughs> because right. I thought, you know, here's a kid who's really going out there, because once you told me, you told us, and you told us the day that you were supposed to, we were going to get in the car and drive to Santa Barbara, that you were not going to college, Yeah. right then is when you think, is this really going to work or not? Are you really going to make a life for yourself? When did you, when, when you finally said, well, okay, I'm going to go, I'm going to take courses now through the University yeah. of Minnesota, Yeah. When, what brought that on? You say, okay, yeah. now I'm going to go back. I'm going to have to go back and do something rather more yeah. traditional in order to do what yeah. I think I so, want to so do. So first of all, let, let's, re, let's remind you and me, that was six years after right. high school. Right. So in that intervening six years, you know, I worked at a computer store. I, did, I, I worked at Alpha Microsystems and repaired hard disk drives. Went on a 15,000-mile trip. It took six months. I was an electrician for four years. I crawled around in attics in Santa Barbara and La Jolla. <laughs> um, and I was studying all the time. And what happened is I was on a three-month trip to Europe. And I was sitting on a train, and a guy from Westinghouse, an executive, was sitting next to me. His name was Donald Trexler. I've met him once in my life. And he told me I was an idiot. I basically told him that I had a resume <laughs> that said that I had read this and that book and that I'd learned this and that physics and so on. And, and I said I sent it out to Beckman Instruments and all these places, and they basically didn't even answer me. And he said, well, you're an idiot. You know, go get your union card. So what happened is I came back to San Diego, and I went to the UCSD library. And I found this book called How to Get a College Degree Without Going to College. And there were four universities that I found that had these sort of university without walls type right, programs right. where you could earn a degree without going to college. Because the, I just think that I'm not suited. I, I, you know, I'm a failure as a, as a classroom student. You know, I don't like tests. I don't like the notion of one person telling other people what they are that's supposed to know. That's interesting. I don't know. remember your tra the gentleman's story about on the train. Yeah. That's really interesting. So that's, yeah, so really, that's what, really what happened. What really so, got you going. And then, and then the connection to grad school is, is because Chuck Campbell, who was at Minnesota, you know, he, 
everybody was kind of against them admitting a physics student, but he said, let the guy fail. And you know, to me, that's one of the main philosophies of life. Let people fail. Give them a chance to fail because we, we're very conservative. And you know, I like to use sports analogies. You know, all my heroes in surfing and snowboarding, they pay. They pay with getting hurt. And the reason is because they are right on the edge. And that's the kind of science mm. that I like. So at any rate, he said, let the guy fail. And after I talked to him, he said, you know, you should go to grad school. And I didn't even, I had no clue what grad school was, none. And I said, okay, I'll try it out. And, and so I applied and I got into some of the places such as WashU and, so and UCSD. You did. Yeah. And so you did. Yeah. As I mentioned at the beginning, until the age of 33, we were still getting financial help from you and dad. So I'm curious to hear your thoughts about the graduate student trajectory, you know, the, the hardship financially and the not knowing where you're gonna, gonna, going to get a job. You know, a lot of graduate students and postdocs, they go exactly Scary. through what we went through, where you yes, wonder, am I going to get a professorship? You know, you remember I, I interviewed on Wall Street. So what are your thoughts about that? Well, I think, it, you know, if you can manage it, obviously, you have to, you try to manage it. It's your children and you want them to get the best you can for them. So, sure, it's not easy financially. I think even more important is the wondering about, in your case, where you don't go in the traditional way. And yeah. I remember when you were trying to, you're even getting your first postdoc. Yeah. I remember you saying something like, oh, well, they're going to want somebody that went to Harvard and they, they came up the traditional way. And yeah. I'd say, oh, well, no, I'm sure things will be all right, not knowing, of course. But I had a great, I had great, I just thought you did a great job. I was sure he was going to come, yeah, but, but it's but, hard, it's know, hard. It's, I would just say that there's a, there's a lot of emphasis on that, the blue blood aspects. I mean, yes, it, it, does have, it, it does have a big effect on things. It does. What about parenting? You know, coming, I, I'd just like to a little bit come back to these things of, you know, I'm thinking about the many rough, road, rough steps along the way. So, you know, the, I mentioned earlier that Lance got killed, and then you remember that his brother Joe, who was also my dear friend, drowned in the ocean uh, not, too, not too long after that. And, um, and again, some of these adventures and the dangers, you know, I, I guess I'm just, I'm very curious to hear how it played out. And I think you may remember a story from Caltech. I'm not going to mention who the grad student was, but you were visiting and one of the, my grad students made a remark about how all this stuff that we're talking about now was actually me telling stories about myself and you bit his head off uh, because you lived it. And again, I'm not, this isn't about glorifying anything that happened. It's, more, it's actually quite the opposite. I'm still just very curious about, I would have been quite fearful if I had been in your boat. I'm not sure I would have been able to handle it, having our ki my kids I do the... I, I don't know how I handled it. I, I wasn't as fearful as I would... When I look back on it, I think, you know, I probably should have been scared out of my mind. I think I took it rather well. You did. No, there's no doubt about it. <laughs> about parenting? I think yeah. it's the one thing in life nobody ever teaches anyone, yeah. and it's something you, it's like just trial you and error. You muddle through. <laughs> you muddle, you would know that, you muddle through. Yeah, you through. muddle through. And but certainly the, the, way, the way you went about living your life and starting out on your trajectory was scary, and a lot of times I was afraid, and obviously when you were gone I missed you terribly. But as I say, I think you really showed rather quickly that you were going to make it. The thing that's easy to take for granted and that's not obvious, I think, to people is may, there's a bit of nuance about how these stories play out that has to do with the family that surrounds you. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, I here at MBL, I see people with their families and you can kind of get a sense that, okay, that's somebody where there's some magic going on in that household. And, you know, I know I've said it before, but this is a pretty great day because it's your 80th birthday and it's, uh, and it's my birthday. 50th, fourth birthday. And yesterday was our, my daughter and your granddaughter's birthday. Uh, it's, a good, it's a time for reflection since we're all together. Okay. And also, you know, I'm here as the director of the physiology course, which is a dream come true and an impossibility to even 10 years ago to have imagined that I would have that privilege. And so I guess what I would say about it is that, you know, I would like the viewers to, to be aware of it, is that it took a lot of support. Financial support, of course, but I'm not really talking about that. I'm talking about the emotional, the psychological, the intellectual support that you and dad gave all of us, but you know, me especially, along this crazy adventure. You know, and um, the adventure continues, and our adventures continue together. Let's hope. Yeah. And uh, I guess I just want, I'm looking forward to having a, a nice rest of the day with you. And I love you very much. I love you very much. And I'm very proud of you. Very proud of you. <laughs>